Okay, G3C, ionospheric layers, critical angle and frequency, uh, high frequency scatter, and near vertical incidence sky waves. Um, which of the following ionospheric layers is closest to the surface of the Earth? We saw that in the graphic. That's the D layer. And here we are again with the graphic. Uh, the D layer is the one nearest to the Earth. Where on Earth, on the Earth, do ionospheric layers reach their maximum height? And the correction, uh, the uh, answer is when the sun is overhead. Why is the F2 region mainly responsible for the longest distance wave propagation? Uh, it's because it's the highest ionospheric region, so you get a longer, a longer reflection from it. Why do, why, what does the term critical angle mean as used in radio wave propagation? The critical angle is the highest takeoff angle that will return a wave to the Earth under specific ionospheric conditions. So here's your critical angle here. And you can see if a wave takes off at this angle, it will be reflected or refracted back to Earth. But if I take that same signal and launch it at this angle, it will keep on going out because that angle is greater than the critical angle. Now this is frequency dependent. Because here you see, under the same conditions, I can launch a 2 megahertz signal at this angle and it will come back. But the 5 megahertz signal launched at this angle will keep right on going. Okay? My maximum, my critical angle for 5 megahertz is this angle right here. So it's the highest takeoff angle that will return a radio wave to the Earth under specific ionospheric conditions. Why is long distance communication on the 40, 60, 80, and 160 meter bands more difficult during the day? It's because the D layer absorbs these signals, uh, signals at these frequencies during the daylight hours. What is the characteristics of HF scatter signals? HF scatter uh, they have a wavering sound, and the reason is, here would be, here's your normal skip right here. Uh, here, or here you can see it not quite skipping because here it's not going to come back to Earth, is it? Uh, but we can get some reflection back from here, from the ionosphere, and it, they have a wavering sound. They are not, it's not a solid signal. But this is within the skip zone where normally you couldn't hear anything. Uh, normally you'd hear the signal here. Uh, you would not hear it. Uh, your ground wave might go to here, let's say. And uh, this area in here, you would not hear the signal at all if it were not for some of the signal, very low level, uh, being scattered back uh, from this layer. So that's why it has a wavering sound. Uh, and. Uh, uh, not high intel intelligibility. Uh, what makes HF scatter signals often sound distorted? The energy is scattered into the skip zone through several different radio wave paths. And they're showing that in the, in the graphic right here. It's coming through various paths. Why are HF scatter signals in the skip zone usually weak? Only a small part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone. What type of radio wave propagation allows a signal to be detected at a distance too far for ground wave, uh, but too near for a normal sky wave propagation? And the answer is scatter.
And that's what that graphic has been showing. Uh, too far for ground wave, but too near for normal sky wave. Which of the following might be an indication that signals heard on the HF band are being received by a scatter propagation? The signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. So here's what you get with the maximum usable frequency. And you're getting a little bit back here. Uh, from the scatter. Which of the following antenna types will be most effective for skip communications on 40 meters during the day? Horizontal dipoles placed between 1 8 and 1 quarter wavelength above the ground. The, way, the height above the ground influences the, uh, the angle, uh, the launch angle for the, uh, the radio wave. Which ionospheric layer is most absorbent of long skip signals during daylight hours on frequencies below 10 megahertz? The D layer. The D layer is the densest layer, you'll remember, from the graphic. And it's the one that does the most absorbing of radio signals. What is near vertical incidence sky wave propagation? It's short distance propagation using high elevation angles. I have a graphic here for that. Uh, this is important out here in the islands for high frequency communications because uh, if we were uh, using ordinary sky wave, uh, we'd skip over a lot of places. But with near vertical incident sky wave, I can communicate uh, easily between uh, Big Island and uh, Oahu or up to Kauai or to uh, Maui in between uh, because I launch at a high angle and it comes back down at a sharp angle. Okay, so this is near vertical incident sky wave, and uh, it supports this kind of, of propagation. Now, you have to be below the critical frequency, don't you? Otherwise, that's just going to keep going right on out through the ionosphere. It's typically a half-wave uh, dipole near the ground, and over poorly conductor soils, a counterpoise or reflector element uh, at or on or slightly above the ground will improve the performance, and that should be about 15% longer than the dipole. Here's one that I use. Uh, this is a portable one that I can set up pretty quickly. Uh, here's my dipole right here. Uh, this is a support in the center. It's a non-metallic support just made from some plastic tubing. Uh, here's one end of it with an insulator here. There's the other end of it way down here with the insulator here. This is 76. Is that right? Uh, 70, 72 feet long. And then here on the ground, you can see I have a reflector laid down. And it's just another wire that's about 15% longer than the dipole. And it's just lying on the ground here, stretched between those two points. And that helps to direct the radio wave from here uh, straight up or nearly straight up to give me that near vertical incident sky wave. And this communicates quite effectively all up and down the, the island chain. This is a 40-meter antenna. 